I can't begin to express to you my delight uh, at being here back in Westminster Seminary. I came here as a student in 1978. That's over 40 years ago. And it seems as though all my life has been bound up uh, with this institution and the, the wonderful uh, testimony and witness that it bears right across the world. As an institution, Westminster Seminary punches way above its weight. Uh, when you come onto the campus at first, you say, Westminster Seminary? It looks weak, it looks frail, but it's going to look better. And uh, we're so, so delighted to be here, especially remembering this significant event in the life of our seminary. And for me personally, it's highly significant that we look back 50 years. In 1969, as an 18-year-old, uh, I went to university. Uh, and one of the first books that I picked up from the Christian Union bookstall was Dr. Lloyd-Jones' Studies in the Sermon on the Mount. It had a huge impact on me. If you know those studies, there's a chapter in there called The Narrow Way. And I remember just being so overtaken uh, by the truth he was expressing in those studies. <clears throat> it had a huge impact on my life. And 50 years later, I'm only getting started in terms of understanding and implementing the great truths developed and described in those volumes. For the first six or seven years of my ministry, I read preaching and preachers every summer. And it was formative for me in the early years of my ministry. 1969 was also a very significant year in the history of Northern Ireland. It marked the beginning of an IRA terrorist campaign that resulted in the death of 3,500 people during that period that we refer to as the Troubles. The British Army's rule in Northern Ireland began that year. It lasted for 38 years, the longest continuous military operation in its history. So the particular topic that has been assigned to me by my dear friend John is that of preaching in conflict and controversy, the challenge of defending the truth. Interesting, isn't it, that it should be assigned to an Irishman? Uh, as they say in the UK, God's salvation suits everyone. It suits the Englishman because he can talk about it. It suits the Welshman because he can sing about it. It suits the Irishman because he can fight about it. <laughs> and it suits the Scotsman because he gets it for nothing. Um, <laughs> and it's true that ministering and preaching in Ireland, as I've done for most of my ministry, brings one into a situation of conflict and controversy. Pastoral ministry generally, and a preaching ministry in particular, involves us in a bruising and a difficult battle. Some of you, I guess, bear the scars and carry the wounds which have been inflicted as a result of involvement in the great spiritual battle that we call gospel ministry. And the geographical location doesn't matter. Wherever God has called us, we're in a battle, we're in a war, we're in a conflict. As John has hinted, in Ireland, in my own denomination in particular, we've been seeking to discharge our ministry in a God-honoring way in the context of widespread community tensions, terrorist violence, which has resulted in so much pain, and it has literally been a conflict and a battle. And in our denomination, as we have sought to move in a more biblical direction, we have experienced our own internal tensions. Our church has sought to uphold and maintain biblical standards with regard to church membership, uh, particularly last year at our General Assembly and the year before, we were discussing what a credible profession of faith really means. And that created some considerable tension uh, in the little college that, uh, that I look after. You know what? Uh, this is a wonderful um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, but it's the one for my next talk. And 
I'm sorry about that. I should have checked that before, so I'll come back to that later. Um, <laughs> he, he, here I Ah, oh, Jennifer, are you coming to my aid? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I should have checked this before. It's entirely my fault, Jennifer. You know, I, I thought I was doing really well in having these PowerPoint presentations. And uh, yeah, boy, I'm humbled. <laughs> I'm only defending the truth. I'm not preaching the truth at this time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. So here's our little college in Belfast. Um, we'd been partnering with Queen's University in Belfast, which is just across the street from us, in the delivery of theology for almost 100 years. But because of the position that our denomination took on matters of gender and marriage, the university decided to bring that relationship to an end uh, last academic year. Uh, in our, uh, we still have some students, and if any of you would crave a, a PhD from a UK institution, come and talk to me. We'd be delighted to, to help you. Uh, and as a church, we've been very uncomfortable uh, with regard to the direction of travel being followed by our brothers and sisters in the Church of Scotland, so that our relationship with the Church of Scotland has become fraught in so many ways. In so many ways, individually and corporately, we have felt the heat and the tension and the pain of being in a battle. If I might change the metaphor, we preachers wade in treacherous and perilous waters. And the waters are dangerous, not because our listeners have a propensity towards self-deceit and the evasion of the truth, but also because the waters that have been stirred up and troubled by the life-changing gospel centered on a living and a risen and a glorified Christ. William Willimon records the words of a pastor at a preacher's conference saying, I never want to cause division or dissension in one of my sermons. I believe in a ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of encouragement. Christ has called me to be a peacemaker. And Willimon's response was to think that if a preacher is committed to the homiletics of reconciliation, such that he never wants dissension, never wants trouble in the congregation, he surely must never preach from the Bible. There's a sense in which the intention of Scripture is the provocation of, or at least a ministry to, conflict, rather than its avoidance. The goal of preaching is not simply to speak in a gentle, mild-mannered way to the modern world, but to move people from the world of unbelief to a different world. An old world, old allegiances, must give way to a new one. And people do not generally let go of their old, predictable, comfortable world without a fight. To hear the gospel is to be wakened up to realize that one's living in a different world, a world where Christ is Lord and sovereign. And the preaching of the gospel seeks to redeem and to detoxify and to set people free from that which enslaves them. The gospel asserts that Christ is in charge, that he sits on the throne. And this is the preacher's message our God reigns. How beautiful. On the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And preaching makes this wide-ranging, this cosmic claim about the rule and reign of the Lord, Jesus Christ. It stands up against the claims of this world, and it disputes the claims of this world with the cry that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the middle of his commentary on Isaiah, Martin Luther exclaims how difficult an occupation preaching is. Indeed, to preach the word of God is nothing less than to bring upon oneself all the fullness of hell and of Satan, and therefore also of every power of this world. 
it is the most dangerous kind of life to throw oneself in the way of Satan's many teeth. In his wonderful little book, Contending for Our All, John Piper quotes Dr. Machen. Men tell us that our preaching should be positive and not negative, that we can preach the truth without attacking error. But if we follow that advice, we shall have to close our Bible and desert its teachings. The New Testament is a polemic book, almost from beginning to end. Every really Christian utterance, great Christian utterance, it may almost be said, is born in controversy. It is when men have felt compelled to take a stand against error that they have risen to the really great heights in the celebration of truth. That understanding of Christian ministry and of the Christian life in general was one of the great themes that underpinned the life and ministry of the good Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He took great care to spell out the nature of the conflict, the proper biblical response that Christians should make on a number of occasions and in a number of places. The most thorough treatment is made in his exposition of Ephesians 6. But he repeatedly called attention to the fact that the call of Christianity was a call to a barracks. It's an enlistment in an army, not to a hospital. All the military metaphors of the New Testament were a steady reminder to us of the conflict, the battle to which we are called as both Christians and preachers. I don't need to remind you that the conflict is described very clearly in the pages of Holy Scripture. From the initial word spoken by God in Genesis 3 about the tension and the conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, right through to that picture of the triumphant lamb in the revelation of John, we have a story, we have a narrative centering around that conflict. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness makes effort upon effort to extinguish it. But in the providence and plan and sovereignty of God, the darkness has never overcome it. Friends, the light shines brightly in our world today. By God's grace, it will eventually encompass the whole earth in a bright and glorious day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. But in the meantime, we're enlisted in the army and we're called to battle. And what we find in the preaching of the doctor is this great example of how to engage as preachers in that warfare. And his big point is that preaching is one of the main ways in which we do battle. In June 1964, Lloyd-Jones gave the 16th and final lecture in the Campbell Morgan Memorial Bible Lectureship Series at Westminster Chapel. His text was 2 Corinthians 10:4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And the, the title uh, for that lecture uh, was simply The Weapons of Our Warfare. It, it was very appropriate for a lecture dedicated to the memory of Dr. Campbell Morgan. He, remember, he was his predecessor in Westminster Chapel, and he himself had been centrally engaged in that fight for the faith in the early years of the 20th century. Back then, uh, the uh, battle centered around what they referred to as the new theology, part of the advance and influence exercised by the higher critical movement, which had begun in Germany in the 1840s. And it was influencing greatly life and thought in the Christian church in Britain. Campbell Morgan engaged, but he didn't enter the controversy by writing articles or letters to periodicals or to journals. His method of fighting was to expound the scriptures. Lloyd-Jones records a conversation that he had with a Welsh layman about how people down in Wales had been influenced by this new theology uh, and that their faith was somewhat shaken by it. 
But this layman said, Dr. Campbell Morgan came down to the Rhonda Valley for a week and he held a series of meetings. And he simply expounded the scriptures in a series of sermons on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ under the theme, who is this son of man? The layman said he was put right immediately and he remained right ever after. And in answering this attack on the faith, Campbell Morgan's method was the positive exposition of the scriptures and it repelled the attack. I don't need to remind this audience of how clearly the lines between truth and error were drawn in the early 20th century here in this part of the world and led to the establishment of this seminary. It's very interesting to note the way in which uh, Dr. Machen responded to the situation. He says, as for me, he says, I believe great opportunity has been opened to Christian people by the controversy that is so much decried. During the academic year, 1924-25, there's been something like an awakening. Youth has begun to think for itself. The evil of compromising associations has been discovered. Christian heroism in the face of opposition has come again to its rights. A new interest has been aroused in the historical and philosophical questions that underlie the Christian religion. True and independent convictions have been formed. Controversy, in other words, has resulted in a striking intellectual and spiritual advance. Some of us discern in all of this the Spirit of God. Controversy, note the next phrase, of the right sort is good. For out of such controversy as church history and scripture alike teach, there comes the salvation of souls. I'm not sure that many of us today would embrace the opportunity that controversy brings in that way or with that degree of enthusiasm. And while the battle lines remain in place, the situation we currently face is one of great confusion. The lines are more blurred now than before. Not only in the academic societies and the various sub-disciplines of theology, but in the wider culture, there's a huge and widespread opposition to orthodox reformed Christianity. Almost every doctrine of the faith is challenged or rejected. The tectonic plates of morality have shifted in our culture so that traditional Christian beliefs are not only rejected or ignored, but they're viewed by many as being positively dangerous. In the area of sexual ethics, to insist on traditional biblical values, humans as male and female, marriage between one man and one woman, purity before marriage and faithfulness within marriage, are all considered so hurtful, so damaging, so repressive, that they cannot even be spoken about or commended in many places. And that's why, more than ever, we need places like Westminster Seminary. We need to be producing effective preachers who can engage effectively in this battle. Lloyd-Jones said there were three main dangers facing those who are evangelical and reformed in the 1960s. One is to think that there is no warfare. Back in the 1960s, the myth was being circulated that we had moved into a new world, that there's a changed theological climate. The old liberalism, the new theology had been killed off by the First World War. There was even the belief that the tension between theology and science had evaporated as a result of the new atomic physics. There was much talk about change in the Roman Catholic Church under Pope John XXIII. Lloyd-Jones pointed out that the teaching of Barth and Bultmann and Tillich needed to be viewed carefully. No one should think that the battle between truth and error had ended. The warfare continued, he said. And neither should we be lulled into thinking that there's no battle raging. It's as intense and as fierce as ever. I don't think that any of us here today thinks we're living in peacetime, either theologically or morally. 
The second danger is that while we may recognize there's a war going on, we may choose to avoid it or to ignore it. We may think <coughs> that whatever issues there are in the wider scene, we should keep our head down, get on with the job in our own patch without risking the dangers and the perils of the bigger battle. One of the features of evangelical and reform preaching in Ireland during that period that we refer to as the Troubles was that many evangelical preachers retreated into a kind of pietism. They focused almost exclusively on sharing your faith, calling people to repent and turn to Christ, fostering the devotional life of prayer and Bible reading among Christian people. It was comparatively easy to denounce the evil atrocities that the paramilitaries and the terrorists were inflicting on the community. Much more difficult to address the underlying issues of the conflict, issues of prejudice, issues of sectarianism among church-going people. So the hard and the unpopular topics were avoided. And that remains a common response. We don't want to address the really difficult issues in our common life. Where our people need to be challenged, we simply avoid them, we simply ignore them. It's not that we're always seeking a fight. It's not that we're looking for a confrontation, but sometimes a lack of courage. Sometimes an addiction to gaining and receiving the adulation and the approval of our people muzzles us from speaking out on certain topics. One of the greatest obstacles to effective ministry is a lack of courage. We must speak where the scriptures speak. And the scriptures, if they are handled and expounded in any kind of systematic way, will inevitably address the controversial issues. John Piper makes a very important point. He says that controversy is crucial for the sake of life-giving truth. Running away from it is a sign of cowardice. But on the other hand, he says, enjoying it is usually a sign of pride. And he says the reason why enjoying controversy is a sign of pride is because humility loves truth-based unity more than truth-based victory. Humility delights to worship Christ in spirit and in truth. If it must fight for worship sustaining truth, it will. But that's not because the fight is pleasant. It's not even because the victory is pleasant. It's because knowing and loving and proclaiming Christ for who he really is and what he really did is pleasant. Of course, there will be always those who will argue that there are more crucial and urgent tasks than engaging in controversy about the truth and the meaning of the gospel. They will claim it's more immediately crucial that we believe the gospel, that we proclaim the gospel, that we pray for the advance of the gospel, and that's true. But it's a bit like saying that flying food to starving people is more crucial than aeronautical engineering. That's true. But if we don't have aeronautical engineers, we won't be able to fly anything to anybody. It's a bit like saying giving penicillin to children who are dying of fever is more immediately important than the work of biologists and chemists. True, but without the work of biology and chemistry, there would be no penicillin. And so evangelism and prayer and worship will not survive unless they are grown in the rich soil of Christ-centered Bible teaching, where the truth is declared with clarity and with conviction. We need clear truth. We need solid theological foundations if we're going to preach the gospel with power and authority and anointing. But the main point that Lloyd-Jones made in that lecture was the danger of fighting the war with the wrong weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, says the apostle. And in stating it in the negative, the apostle is really clarifying the nature of this warfare. 
In saying what weapons Christian preachers should avoid, the apostle has given positive practical advice to his readers. And for one of the overall themes of these two epistles to the Corinthians is this whole matter of how we fight the battle of faith. And we need to be clear that we're using the right weapons, and already in this conference, that has been made clear to you. It is the preaching of the word and prayer. There are many weapons that don't belong in our armory. The apostle mentions some of them here in the context of that verse. We shouldn't fight this battle with our personalities. I, Paul, myself entreat you with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you. I was struck again just reading over that this morning about gentleness as a key Christian and pastoral virtue. And that's why some people in Corinth were criticizing Paul. He didn't have this striking personal appearance. They said his bodily presence was weak. His speech was contemptible. People of Corinth were interested in the big charismatic personality, and Paul just didn't tick their boxes. And they made these offensive remarks about his appearance and looks. And according to all accounts, Paul was probably a small, bald man who suffered from an inflammation of his eyes. But Paul wouldn't go there. He wouldn't fight in that kind of way. He spoke about humility, his lack of an, an impressive or big personality. He refused to follow that path. It's amazing how much interest there is in the personality and appearance of preachers today. A number of well-known writers and thinkers in our own circles have pointed out the dangers of this trend towards creating and encouraging celebrities within our evangelical culture. According to the apostle, that's a carnal way of fighting. Part of the problem at Corinth, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. Following personalities back then and the cult of personality and celebrity is still very much with us. It's interesting, uh, Jason was referring to this earlier, what the doctor had to say generally about the personality of the preacher. On the one hand, he was clear in his condemnation of preachers using a big personality as a weapon in the spiritual battle, and he rejected that view, but he believed that the preacher should be a man of strength, an arresting man, a man with an element of command about him, must be able to think and to study and to have the gift of speech, a man, he said, may be a very good man. He may be a very godly man, but if he cannot speak, except in a halting, stumbling manner, he has no business to be in the pulpit. There's also the question of methods. Remember how the apostle had dealt with that in the first epistle? I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. He didn't use the rhetoric of the Greeks. He didn't manipulate his hearers with clever rhetorical tricks. He avoided the techniques of the world, careful not to seek to be a people pleaser, as scrupulous about his methods as he was about his message. Uh, one, one of the methods that Lloyd-Jones singled out as being inappropriate, interesting, maybe over lunchtime you'll have your discussion on this, was that of advertising the church, setting up publicity departments to sell to the church to the world, the way you might, he said, present a play or a drama or sell soap. It all sounds rather strange to us today in the world of social media. But he believed that the apostle condemned all that as being carnal. He believed it was man's method, human wisdom, human knowledge, even human trickery. Our methods, says the apostle, are not carnal. Lloyd-Jones believed that the greatest danger facing the evangelical church in the 1960s was that of trying to make Christianity acceptable to people. And he, he recognized the motivation of those who promoted that approach. He said it was an evangelistic one. They believe that the gospel can only be accepted by people if we can make it intellectually respectable. 
Its proponents claimed we're living now in an educated, a scientific age. We must show that our message is a reasonable one that has an air of academic or intellectual respectability. And then he carefully traces how this attempt to accommodate the gospel with the thinking and the philosophy of the age has afflicted the church down through the ages. He quotes Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, who all, he said, made significant concessions to a worldly way of thinking in order to gain a hearing. And he argues that when too much philosophy comes in, we're using the wrong weapons. We end up with an intellectual system rather than a dynamic and a living faith. We lose the type of preaching that we find in the New Testament. And underlying it all, said the doctor, was this spirit of fear. We are so anxious to be thought intellectually respectable, afraid of being charged with not being intellectual. He believed that we were in danger of worshiping scholarship in the wrong sense and being guilty of intellectual pride. And of course, that was the precise danger that Paul faced in Corinth. The Corinthians wanted Paul to demonstrate that he was in line with the wisdom of their world. Their complaint was that he didn't use words of eloquent wisdom. He was so simple. He preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. No argumentation in the way Greek philosophers argued. And they criticized him. And Paul takes up the whole matter in the very first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And as soon as we begin to massage and adjust the message of the cross, we empty it of its power. So the doctor argues stridently that using the weapons of philosophy or scholarship or science in an attempt to make the gospel acceptable to one's audience is fundamentally wrong. Humanity is in a state of sin and blindness. The carnal mind is enmity against God. The natural person doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The idea you can take the gospel and because of modern knowledge, present it in a way that's going to be easier for a modern man to believe, he said, is a denial of the gospel. The offense of the cross is gone. The scandal of Christianity has evaporated. The foolishness of preaching is no longer true. The weapon which God has placed in our hands is prayer and the preaching of the gospel. And for Lloyd-Jones, the most important emphasis in using that weapon is the spirit in which we fight. Over against a spirit of fear, we need a spirit of confidence, as is reflected in the words of the apostle. We need to get rid of our inferiority complex we need to stop apologizing for the word of God. He says in fighting modern unbelief, don't make the mistake of entering the battle dressed in Saul's armor. Because at one level, the armor's impressive. But ultimately, you're going to stumble. You're going to be defeated. You're going to fall. Let David fight in David's way. And from one perspective, a sling and a few stones seem ridiculous. What chance is that wee lad against such a big giant? But this is God's way. And it's the way God uses to gain the victory. He says the way to overcome is to adopt the attitude of David. You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I'll strike you down and cut off your head that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Brothers and sisters, that's the way to fight. With confidence and assurance that the Lord is God and that he is with us. Or like Gideon, not with great battalion of men, but with a handful of people who could be trusted. 
With only pictures in their hands and lights in them, they overcame the great company of the enemy forces. With a great shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And you know, what gives us great confidence in our preaching is that we are handling the word of God. God's revelation. The theories, the ideas of men with respect to the truth will not destroy strongholds and arguments. What is invincible is what God has revealed and which, what he has commanded to us to preach. It's from God, not the product of human study and scholarship and meditation. We learn to say what Paul said to the Galatians. I'd have you to know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to me is not man's gospel. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it as a revelation of Jesus Christ. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. That was Paul's position. And in this spiritual battle, it must be ours as well. It is the word of God, God's true and infallible revelation, which is to be proclaimed, not just to be defended, but to be proclaimed with a holy boldness. We don't need dialogue, said the doctor. We need declaration. Now, I've forgotten about my PowerPoints. I had all this stuff in here. Yeah, that's good, Stafford. Yeah, I remember that. But having said all that, you would think that Lloyd-Jones was commending an aggressive, confrontational, and negative approach. A lot of military-style aggression. That would be a complete misunderstanding of his position. Go back and read the lectures he gave here at Westminster 50 years ago. And he spoke about the danger of being over-polemical. There's a danger that we all face, and especially in certain sections of our own Reformed constituency. We're often ready to engage in what we might call not-so-friendly fire at those who are on our own side of the battle line. We attack those who are not our enemies, and it does great damage to the cause of the gospel. The doctor recognized that there are some preachers who struggle with rival theories and heresies and wrong interpretations of the scriptures, and their minds are just full of this. And the danger is that they allow an awful lot of that to seep into their preaching. And they said, they can be terribly popular. Some people will travel for miles in order to hear a brutal and a slashing attack on a man or a theory or a doctrine. But Lloyd-Jones recognized that this tendency can ruin good ministries. So he reports in these lectures given here on this location, he reports a conversation that he had with a well-known polemical preacher and how they discussed this whole matter of attacking people and theories and making mincemeat of them. <clears throat> this man, Lloyd-Jones said, had a reputation for his tirades, especially on Sunday evenings against some erroneous liberal Protestant teaching, or against Roman Catholicism, or even against other preachers. <clears throat> and his onslaughts were done brilliantly, he said. But Lloyd-Jones believed they were ruining his ministry. And they tried to persuade him to return to more evangelical and expository preaching. But the man in the conversation made three arguments. Firstly, he said, well, I'm following the pattern Paul describes in Galatians 2, where Paul says that when Peter went astray, he withstood him to his face. That's all I'm doing, he said. I'm simply doing what Paul did. But Lloyd-Jones pointed out what the result was. By his confrontation with Peter, Paul won Peter over to his position. He persuaded Peter that he was wrong, such that Peter, in his second epistle, expresses great admiration for Paul and for his writings. Can you say the same about the people you attack? Asks the doctor. 
If you can win people by polemics, then all is well. But be very careful. You don't end up antagonizing them still more. <clears throat> be very careful you don't open the gap even more widely. A second argument was, well, as a medical man, Lloyd-Jones, what would you do if a patient has a growth in his system? And if that is allowed to grow, it's going to kill him. Surely the surgeon will take action and perform some radical surgery. When cancer comes into the body of Christ, it has to be removed, he said. And Lloyd-Jones responded by describing the surgical mentality of some doctors such that, he said, they become knife-happy. They think only in terms of operations and of surgery. When someone becomes ill, said the doctor, you shouldn't rely exclusively on the advice of the surgeon, but check out the advice of a general practitioner or a physician. Not all conditions require radical surgery. And he goes on to say that preachers should avoid the knife-happy surgical mentality and see and think that that's the only solution for all conditions. The preacher's final argument was to say, well, when I attack the heretics and false teachers, the circulation of my weekly newspaper simply rockets up. I get a great response. What do you say to that, Lloyd-Jones? Well, said the doctor, I've always noticed that when two dogs are fighting, a crowd always gathers. And there are people who simply enjoy a good fight. They'll always be there to support you. They'll always be there to cheer you on. But it doesn't build up a church. So in this whole matter of defending the truth, Lloyd-Jones was seeking to strike this balance. There are those who like to have a reputation of being nice men, never negative, always positive. They like to describe themselves in those terms. But Lloyd-Jones says that's sheer humbug and hypocrisy. The scriptures have a polemical element. It must be present in our preaching as we warn our people, as we guide our people, as we protect the flock. So don't allow yourself to develop the idea that you are the defender of the truth so that you're always attacking people and always attacking erroneous points of view, that becomes negative, that becomes destructive, that will ruin the life and the vitality of the church. In this battle in which we are enlisted, preaching and prayer are our effective weapons. But Jason pointed it out beautifully. As a sharp and effective weapon, the sword of the Spirit needs to be wielded and applied with great skill and with much sensitivity. Not all enemies are the same. The same tactics, the same strategies do not work on every occasion. Just as the most effective generals in battles and wars of this world were men of wisdom and insight and strategy, so we need great wisdom as we approach our enemy. But we do so in the knowledge that our weapons are mighty through God. This is the great truth. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Lloyd-Jones reflected the thrust of what Paul says when he emphasizes that our effectiveness and success in the battle is totally dependent on the power of God. We are mighty through God, through the power and the demonstration of the Spirit of God. It took the mighty power of God to floor and humble and knock down Saul of Tarsus and to raise him up for fruitful ministry and service. And he says in every age, with Augustine and Luther and Calvin, with Wesley and Whitfield, it was divine power that sustained them. With their giant intellects and learning and understanding, they were energized with divine power. They were mighty through God. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, in this theater of conflict in which we find ourselves, we crave, we long, we desire that same 
divine power. Lloyd-Jones finished that talk in 1964 by quoting these wonderful words from Isaiah 41, which give us such hope and confidence. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear. I am with you. I will help you. Do not be afraid, O worm, Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Is there an amen anywhere in this house? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We can sing with Wesley, Jesus the Savior reigns. The God of truth and love, when he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. His kingdom cannot fail. He rules over earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. He sits at God's right hand till all his foes submit and bow to his command and fall beneath his feet. Rejoice in glorious hope. Jesus the judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. We soon shall hear the archangel's voice. The trump of God shall sound. Rejoice. Amen.